Ladies and gentlemen, the time is now 7 o'clock, and uh, can someone please close the classroom doors, and the first five minutes will be on the final exam. First of all, I'd like to thank you for coming out tonight, uh, Saturday, uh, Friday evening, uh, it's the only time we could get the hall, it's a popular hall, and in particular, I would like to thank any baseball fans in the audience. How many baseball fans are there here? Well, you're giving up the last game of the World Series to come to an all-candidates meeting, and I'm impressed. Um, I don't think I've given you my name. My name is Ian Cameron. I'll be doing my best to moderate this. As you can see, there's no room for me on the stage because we have so many candidates. And so here's the, uh, the order of procedure. The candidates have drawn lots to see where they would sit, and I'm going to use that as the speaking order as well. Each candidate gets three minutes to state a position at the beginning of the evening and one minute at the end of the evening to sum up. I have more questions, I think, than, uh, than we can um, manage to meet, or uh, sorry, fit into the three hours that we have, but we'll do our best. At the end of the first hour, there will be a five minute break, and at the end of the second hour, another five minute break. So having said that, um, let's get started with the two mayoralty candidates. Right there, we'll start with Mr. Graham and uh, then Mr. Bryson. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Christopher Graham. I'm running for mayor. A lot of people remember me as a 12 year old that was elected to council. I was uh, actually 18 at the time, one of Canada's youngest ever elected. Uh, you might say I grew up on council. I have given the majority of my adult life to the public service and would like you to give me a chance to continue to do so. With my family roots in the area going back to the 1800s, and as a small business owner and local farmer, I am deeply invested in Central Saanich. My partner and I are starting a family here, so I have the strongest interest in keeping this one of the best places in the world to live. I have heard from the community that their top priority is Keating revitalization. Anyone who has served with me on council will know that during my tenure, I pushed for a high-level bylaw review of the allowable uses within the industrial zone to try and generate more business opportunities. I am going to put the weight of the district behind this, including enhanced traffic safety by working with the province to create safer access off the highway, promote redevelopment of residential over business where appropriate to create affordable housing that will enhance economic activity in Keating by bringing in workers and customers more business-friendly bylaws, faster approvals, and a fair tax system. We need to protect our neighborhoods. I believe in infill, but also believe it must work with the community. I disagree with my colleague. I do not support the change in the secondary suite bylaw that is opening up neighborhoods to be bought by land speculators and held as rental properties. I don't see how it will increase the housing stock nor make it more affordable but I do see how it will corrode neighborhoods. I would not take a stand that goes against 88% of the community. I have had a long track record of wise budget management. With careful scrutiny and building relationships while on council, I was successful in having 150,000 of annual grant funding reinstated. I will ensure the same cost overruns that saw tennis courts budgeted at 260,000 Balloon to over 800 or over to 800,000 do not occur with the new fire hall. I have always let you know how I voted on council, and I expect everyone on council should be accountable to the voters. I will do this by reinstating the recording of votes and movers and seconders of motions. You trusted me to be your representative on council from 1996 to 2008. I ask you to trust me again to be your representative as mayor for the next three years. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you, can you hear me okay at the back then? My name is Alistair Bryson, and I'm running for mayor, as you know. 
Uh, I'm currently a councillor in Central Saanich and it's been my pleasure to be on council for six years. I guess um, there's probably going to be questions about the secondary suites because you know, Chris has identified that as something that, that we have different views on and uh, I expect there'll be a question on that so I'll address that later. But I guess that I'd like to take this to a higher level because at some point we have to be prepared to, to demonstrate what the tools are that we can bring to this job uh, of being mayor of the community. There, uh, it's all very well to try to anticipate the issues that are going to come ahead and state sort of where our positions are, etc. But that's not really been my experience in six years. Stuff comes at you and you have to actually go back to your own toolkit and decide what it is that you can bring to that decision-making process. So I'd just like to share the values, perhaps, and the awarenesses, the toolkit that I'll be pulling out when I make decisions for this community over the next three years. So the first thing I'd like to point out is the reason that I farm here. And I farm here not for economic reasons, I can assure you of that. I lose money every year. And we really need to keep that front and center that farmers are having extreme difficulty making things economically viable. I'm subsidizing the food that I produce on my farm at this time. But I do it because I'm aware that the sun shines and that sunshine makes the grass grow. And when the grass grows, we eat the, or the plants, I should say, we eat those plants or animals eat those plants and we eat the animals sometimes. That is what actually sustains the cycle of life on this planet. And we have to really keep awareness that that's Although we're using fossil fuels that have been in the ground for 500 million years, we're using those at an amazing rate. And we have to be able to maintain the awareness that it's the connection back to that cycle of life that actually sustains life. So that's one of the awarenesses that I'll be bringing. The other thing that I think local government is really trying to, the reason I'm passionate about being in local government and politics at a time when being political is not necessarily that popular, is that I see it as being the, the way forward for society that we have, okay, I'm going to use the word, we've evolved uh, from nature as self-aware human beings. We have the sense of being separate selves and having an identity that, that is separate from nature. That's a construct of our minds, and, and it's been extremely successful from an evolutionary point of view. But if we're going to continue, we can't continue in a selfish approach where, where we expand uh, unlimited within the natural capacity of the earth. We actually, we're at 7 billion now, we're going to have to find a way of operating that actually perhaps balances self-interest with community interest. And that's, the in, that's the, what I find really interesting, is how, how are we going to move that forward? Because I think that's actually what's going to be our biggest challenge, is the finite capacity of the planet. Thank you.
at least to hear their concerns and try and incorporate them into their plan. I intend to do that. In the last two some years, I have involved myself in any number of community projects. I'm involved in a family-owned small business, which promotes organic agriculture. We own an organic winery, and I believe strongly in the principles of organic uh, agriculture as a means of sustaining such a small business for the long term. I think that we have to recognize that we live in a municipality that is geographically small, has a lot of farmland, has concentrated commercial and industrial zones. That's struck a good balance so far, but we can strengthen that, we can enhance that by undertaking activity, as Chris mentioned, in the Keating industrial area to enhance opportunities. There's certainly a number that are up for, for enhancement and there's lots of opportunities to be created there. The advantage of keeping those areas compact, though, is that we can protect the other two principles. The protection of agriculture and the protection of our natural places. I happen to be a stream keeper, so I care deeply about the waterways and tributaries in this municipality. I think that uh, we're gaining more understanding on a daily basis about how these things operate. And as we make, uh, get an understanding of how they operate, we need to plan accordingly to protect them. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kathy Almstead, and uh, I thought I had a little less time than I was uh, under the impression, so I'll be short, sweet, and simple. Um, like my decision making, I'm not great at public speaking, but I am a good decision maker. Good evening, my name is Kathy Alstead, and I am pleased to be a candidate running for Central Saanich Council this election. I would like to extend a thank you to the ratepayers of Central Saanich for hosting this meeting this evening. I would like to start off by telling you a little about myself. My husband and Chris, my husband Chris and I are proud parents of an 11 year old son Jake and a 9 year old son Matthew. We have been living in Central Saanich for the past 17 years. We love this community, and because of the love of this community is why I put my name forward to run for council. This community has offered my family a safe and enjoyable place to raise our children. My hope is always to remain living in Central Saanich. Currently, I work at Almstead & Company, a chartered accountant firm which our family owns. I bring with me extensive financial, business, and community experience. I would also like to clear up one misconception, if I may. I do actually live in Central Saanich. I've had some concerned citizens emailing me because my mailing address is Victoria. All of Tanner Ridge has a mailing address of Victoria, but it, jurisdictionally we belong to Central Saanich, and that is where our tax dollars go. Uh, my hope is to represent the everyday average citizen of Central Saanich with a practical and common sense approach to decision making without any hidden agendas only the well-being of the community in mind. It is my concern for this community and its well-being that I wish to be elected to council. Please be sure to keep a copy of my brochure that outlines my platform and to help you with your decision making. I welcome the opportunity to answer to the best of my ability your questions and concerns this evening and thank you for coming and your interest in Central Saanich. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you to the ratepayers for holding this meeting. I am honoured to speak on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people. It's time for positive change in Central Saanich. It's time to bring everyone to the table. My name is Sue Stroud and I am committed to maintaining the rural health and beauty of Central Saanich. I have worked hard and passionately to protect her over the years speaking out at public hearings, writing articles, and advocating for a small, sustainable, and self-sufficient community. I am proud of the helping hand I have been able to offer to those who would set up a recycle depot, fight to save farmland, protect our ferry route, hold a dry grad, and create a more livable, less stressful space for our community. I am opposed to turning us into another cookie-cutter suburb of a larger city. 
We are Tlawainik, the place of refuge, as our First Nations neighbors say, and we need to maintain this vision. We need to respect the land we are using and give back to its future wherever we can. Central Saanich needs to refocus on families and farms and fairness. Our families need safe, affordable, green, and appropriate housing so that our community does not become a monoculture of one age group or one income level. We need to help people live where they work and work where they live to reduce transportation costs and the pollution that goes with long commutes. We need to find incentives and funding for alternative energy use. We need to encourage urban gardening and tree planting to mitigate the effects of climate change. We need to invite small business manufacturers to set up in our industrial park to employ the people who live here. We need to lobby our provincial government for more help for farmers, including perhaps a land bank to buy farms and lease them back at low rates to other farmers. We need a true commitment to our official community plan and the regional sustainability strategy so that our community can concentrate on growing food for the future. We need to respect and understand our agreements with other communities because we are not a law unto ourselves. What we do or fail to do impacts others. We need fairness and accountability, which means all votes must be recorded. We need much more public interaction, more notification of public hearings, of open houses, town halls, and we need to use all the new tools available to us. Central Saanich needs a clearer, more readable budget and accounting system so citizens can easily access the information they need. We need respect for those who come before council. They are the employer and they are the people footing the bill. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you to the ratepayers and to you in the audience for being here this evening. I am Zeb King and I'm running for councillor in Central Saanich. I have six years experience as a councillor where I was an advocate for food security, our environment and better relations with First Nations. I've lived in Central Saanich for about 25 years. Since I was last on council three years ago, my wife and I purchased a home. We, we have no children and no TV, but we have four lovely chickens. <laughs> and from time to time, I get to be a hero and save our chickens from the mink who's trying to sneak up and, and grab one of them. But all kidding aside, this election is different from the last one. I've been knocking on doors and I've been hearing over and over that times are tough and taxes are crippling families. Many of you are feeling shut out and resentful that your concerns are not being listened to. Well, I hear you and I'm listening. I'll bet, I'll, I'll be your voice on council and make sure that the other members of council hear you. If you vote for me, you're, you're voting for open government, open and transparent government. I had regular office hours every week for six years, and I'd do it again. I opposed any proposal that would restrict citizen participation. If elected, I will work to reinstate the recording of votes at council meetings. Before, we were a pay-as-you-go municipality, and that forced us uh, to decide what was essential and what needed to wait. It's easy to spend, it's difficult to prioritize. As a homeowner, I have to decide every day what I can afford, just as you do. So if we have to do it, why can't council? Let's just take a look, just take a look for a minute at the tennis courts, the Taj Mahal of tennis courts. Did they really have to be so deluxe? Could they have waited for a year? Was it the best bang for your buck? A lot of you are telling me that your income hasn't gone up in proportion to spending, and that hits you hard. So when I'm on council, I'm going to fight hard to ensure we put the brakes on overspending. In conclusion, you've got my attention. You, 
I'm listening, so tell me what's important to you because we're going to turn this around. Vote for me, Zeb King. We're on? We are. Wow, that's quite a microphone. Uh, good evening, my name is Robert Thompson and I am seeking your support for election to Central Saanich Council. I served as a councillor most recently from 2002 to 2008 and since 2009 have served as chair of the Central Saanich Advisory Planning Commission. I have been an active volunteer in our community since moving to Saanichton in 1991 and serve on the boards of both the Saanich Peninsula Chamber of Commerce and the Island Farmers Alliance. I am an agri-food marketing consultant working with the Southern Vancouver Island Direct Farm Marketing Association and the Small Scale Food Processor Association. My purpose in running for council is to use this extensive experience in working with our community to find solutions to community issues, to make balanced and respected decisions that promote livable residential neighborhoods, vibrant commercial centers, and a sustainable rural economy within the context of the official community plan. It's been an excitable time for council and the community over the last few years. The public will not always agree with council decisions, but it is imperative that there is respect for how decisions are made. One of my goals is to help build confidence in the decision-making process. Council can look into new communication tools to more effectively tell the community what it's doing and why. And to this end, I also support recording of council votes and webcasts of council meetings. Our OCP has evolved over the last decade in concert with the regional growth strategy, infill, and more recently densification have been proposed as alternatives to suburban sprawl. But it is clear that the public has not bought into this idea. I do support a comprehensive review of densification and creation of guidelines as recommended in the OCP. Local businesses provide us with products and services generating jobs and tax inf income for our community. But business needs our support too, to be sustainable in these tough times. Businesses are concerned with higher tax rates, processing times for permits, affordable housing for employees and safe access to the industrial park. I support a review of business tax rates, better value for tax dollars, and a more active role for local government in promoting economic activity. Finally, farming, we need to recognize, is a business. And just like any other business, it needs to be profitable to be sustainable. We need to actively support our farming community. Saving the ALR is not enough. Farmers are concerned about production costs, farm worker housing, wildlife management, and dumping of construction fill on farmland. I do support development and implementation of wildlife management plans and implementation of the Central Sandwich Area Plan for Agriculture. On November 19th, please elect an independent and experienced councillor with a proven commitment to community, Robert Thompson. Thank you for, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to the ratepayers for providing us this forum. It's my first time, so I'm a little bit nervous. My name is James McNulty and I'm an ALR landowner. My family owns two businesses in Central Saanich, and there's three generations of us living here. Council's role in the community is to engage in conversation, and when you engage in that conversation, you will find conflict. In conflict, there are always two things that will be present. One, that the access to information isn't equal on both sides. And the second thing is that both sides have that same information and they're interpreting differently. My job in council will be to provide an open forum for everyone in the community to have access to all of that information. <sighs> sorry. <laughs> I gotta breathe, take my time, slow down, sorry. What council has to do is provide a forum for the access to that information. Ensure that the, count, the community has full participation in that information. Democracy is not a council 
sorry. Council's role in democracy is not to make decisions for people. Council's role is to enact the decisions of the community. I'm not here to find fault. I'm here to find a remedy and move this community forward. I hope to give you an idea of how I intend to approach serious issues on council. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Carl Jensen. 61, 50, 33. No, I'm not helping you with your 649 picks, although if I could, I'd be pretty popular up here. I'm talking about voter responses to our last federal, provincial, and central Saanich elections. Why is it the closer we get to home, the less interest we as a society show in our politics? The roads we drive on, the water we drink, Renovations to our own home are all driven by municipal politics. In my mind, it's just as important as provincial and federal politics. But I know I appreciate the conv to the converter because you're already all here tonight. But I've got a call to action for each and every one of you tonight. I want each of you to find 10 more people that are going to vote. There's no reason we can't drive that 33% up. It's just as important as the other elections. Now, who am I? I've been living in Central Sanders for 12 years now. I'm married, I've got three children in school. I work at the Ministry of Finance, I work in Forest Revenue Operations. Before that, I worked in the Ministry of Small Business and Revenue as a project manager. I've got a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology and a business degree, a Master's degree in Business. I currently coach two soccer teams for Peninsula Soccer. I'm also the Athletic Director for the Victoria Highland Games Association, which means yes, I do wear a kilt, and yes, I love to toss cabers. But on the municipal side, I've been a member of the Peninsula Recreation Commission now since 2005. I'm currently the chair of that commission. I also sit on the Advisory Planning Commission. If elected, I have three objectives of what I'd like to achieve in Central Sandwich. First, I want to maintain a balance between attainable housing for residents of all income levels while maintaining the rural beauty of this municipality. Second, I want to work with the farmers. I want to work with them to help them identify modern and also financially sustainable farming practices that are going to help them stay in business for years to come. And finally, I also want to revitalize the Keating Business Park. But I'm going to do it by working with the business community, by working with the residents, and working with the municipality. I believe a partnership is the key to success in Keating, and I look forward to taking that vision forward. My name is Carl Jensen. Thank you for your time tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Terry Siklenka, and I'm seeking to be re-elected to Central Sandwich Council. We've got a lot of things happening in the community. We need a lot of important decisions to be made in the future. I've lived here since 2008. I moved here with my wife and we started Le Cafe Chocolat. I made a lot of you desserts and chocolates. And I know what it's like to run a small business in this community. We lived in a farmhouse in behind. And then since then we moved um, to the other side of the border to start a Harvey farm. And then this fall we bought another home in Central Sands that we're currently renovating and moving back to. It's really important that we have involvement in a council that makes decisions and makes decisions for 16 and a half thousand people. Not small interest groups, not individuals, but the entire community. Our decisions affect everybody. Our tax dollars. People talk about how we've done with the, doing the tennis courts, doing the other municipal projects, paving East Saanich Road. These are important things that need to be done recreation, paving of roads, improving infrastructure, it costs money. In the term that we've been on council, we've managed to leverage that multiple times over using higher levels of government to making sure that when we're spending your tax dollars, we spent the time to make the decision and we've leveraged it to the best possible ability that we can. I sit and sit on different councils, training, safety, 
and education in trades in this province, and I currently work for Cairnview Mechanical. I've sat on a number of boards throughout on both the city, provincial level, and I bring that experience to you and my experience as a small business owner in this community and as a manager of businesses through my entire adult life to council. I don't make a decision for one or two people or any self-serving agenda. My decisions are made for all of you. You are the people that put me up here, represent you, and I believe that I've done a good job over the last three years, and I'm asking you for your support for the next three. It's not just a matter of trust, it's making sure that I earn your trust. And I'm willing to do that. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Wayne Spencer. I'm running for council. Um, I am an accountant, and the reason I'm running for council is because I think that council should be accountable to the people that elect them, and uh, I want to make sure that we do that. Uh, as a councillor, if I elected, I intend to be very accessible to all of you and to hear what you're saying, and not just hear what you're saying, but work with you to make decisions. Uh, council is not uh, the people that should be deciding unilaterally, they should have input from everybody. Um, sorry, I'm a little nervous as well. <laughs> uh, I have uh, moved here from Calgary 12 years ago, um, and then I moved to Central Saanich three years ago uh, because I wanted to the rural setting. I want to make sure that the ALR is available and sustainable for future generations. Without that, uh, level of uh, farming within the community, we become very dependent on the ferries and the outside world. And I think that we have the ability here to be somewhat sustainable and uh, that just is not good for just us, but it's good for the entire world. And my name is Wayne Spencer. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out on this beautiful evening in Central Saanich and thank the organizers for this evening. My name is Susan Mason. I'm a positive voice and I'm running for a fourth term on Central Saanich Council. When I say I'm a positive voice, I mean that I always try to look for opportunities and the best solutions. As the longest serving councillor at this table, I bring you the experience historical memory, consistency, and a proven track record. But I do have to confess, I still get nervous when I have to get up and speak in public. From the vantage point of the middle of the political spectrum, I look at all sides and make good decisions based on the merits of individual issues. Many of our senior staff have or will be retiring shortly and we need strong, experienced leaders to ensure a smooth transition and to deal with the many important opportunities and issues facing us. Given today's revenue and infrastructure challenges, the number one priority has to be the district's financial sustainability. We need to increase our tax base and maintain service levels. It is critical that we sustain balance between growth and no growth as set out in our OCP. I have worked hard to explore and encourage economic development, and I believe taking a proactive, promotional approach is key to attracting business, industry, and tourism. My vision of the Keating Industrial Area is a vibrant, work-live environment with affordable housing for workers and young people. With world-renowned Butchart Gardens on our doorstep, I see enormous potential for culinary, wine, and cycling tourism. Taking active steps towards sustaining, promoting, and protecting farming in Central Saanich has been and will continue to be one of my passions. We need to see implementation of our new Agricultural Area Plan and an active Agricultural Advisory Committee. We need to keep working on transportation and safety issues, including bus service, 
slowing traffic on local roads, and continuing to push on the Highway 17 strategy. We have some excellent senior care facilities in the district, but we need to encourage more as our population ages. Because I heard the concerns of residents, I pushed to bring back the issue of residential densification for more public input. Other issues I would like to see reconsidered are owner occupancy of homes with secondary suites and the recording of council votes. We need a stable, balanced council that will make good, common sense decisions, ensuring that we maximize the opportunities open to us and find solutions to the challenges. Finish? I, now? <laughs> <laughs> I, have I got 30 seconds? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Good evening, I'm John Garrison and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. For those of you who do not know me, I'll just give you a brief background for your information. I grew up in rural Saanich on ALR land in the Blenkinsop Valley. I attended UVic for my economics degree, then obtained my chartered accountant's designation before moving to Vancouver. I attended UBC, obtained commerce and law degrees before returning, returning to Victoria. I subsequently was employed as a legal counsel for a Crown Corporation for 25 years and retired in 2006. And I currently work at Slick Lumber on the Peninsula, a great retirement job that has nothing to do with law. However, <laughs> I have been active in municipal politics since 1986. First elected to Saanich Council in 1987, I served five terms until 2002. I was also on the CRD board for nine years, so I have a local and regional perspective. I've also had the honor to be one of your central Saanich councillors for the last six years. And, for, and I've chaired the Finance Committee, Committee during the last term, and I'm also your representative on the Regional Water Commission and on the Crest Board dealing with the emergency ra radio system. Your council has been very active over the last three years on many initiatives, and I'll just mention a couple of them because I think they're important. Well, they're all important, but certainly I'll mention the district's award-winning Integrated Stormwater Management Plan, which took a lot of time to do, and the East Saanich Road Reconstruction, which has just finished, reopened it, and that was at one-third dollars because of federal provincial sharing. We certainly have done, uh, in the environmental issues, lighting retrofits at the Cultural Center, uh, Centennial Park, and other municipal facilities, and we've initiated the new fire hall location. I think there's challenges that continue on a number of fronts, and it's, as you've mentioned from other candidates, a major overriding objective has been and will continue to be keeping our fiscal priorities in order to keep tax increases reasonable given the infrastructure challenges and needs. Well, I believe our community has to address its aging infrastructure needs in a fiscally prudent manner so our children and the future residents inherit our central sandwich as an asset and not a liability. And I think that's very important to consider. I also believe and support the proposed new fire hall as one of those necessary infrastructure needs to protect our citizens, their property, and our firefighters. I believe I have the professional experience, the municipal experience, the regional experience, and the proven commitment over a number of years to represent you for another term on council and ask for your support. And also, just as an aside on a personal note, my wife, Sheila, and I were just blessed with a brand new grandson today at 12, 11. Seven pounds, ten ounces, so we're pretty proud. Thank you. Congratulations, John. That's great. Ready to go? Good evening. Uh, my name is Adam Olson, and I'm seeking re-election to Central Saanich Council. I thank Sue for recognizing the Saanich territory, and uh, I also recognize this wonderful place. Firstly, I'd like to thank the residents and ratepayers of Central Saanich for providing an opportunity for the community to get together and get to know all of the candidates. We should be very proud that this election has uh, produced a very diverse group of representatives to choose from. I'd like to take a minute to thank our current mayor, Jack Marr, for his uh, community service over the last few years. And, and to Alistair, and to John, Ron, Susan, and Terry for working with me, teaching me, 
and listening respectfully to what I have to say, although we always didn't always agree, we spent a lot of time with each other and you've all enriched my life. I love Central Saanich. I'm a product of this community. My family has been here for many generations. I was born and raised on Sartlet First Nation. I went to Little Raven at Hewanu School, Brentwood, Mount Newton Middle School, and Stelly School. I played baseball, soccer, and tennis at Centennial Park. I acted on the stage at Stelly's, and I've known many of you here tonight for most of my life. I work from home. Uh, I'm the work from home father of the cute little boy over there, Silas Wolf. And Emily and I look forward to raising Silas here and growing old here. I have thoroughly enjoyed my first term on council. I've worked very hard on your behalf, and I'm not done yet. I'm seeking re-election because I want to continue this work, and I'm committed to providing balanced representation at the council table and the various board and committee tables that I'm appointed to. We are in difficult times. Before I was elected to council, I had no idea how challenging it would be to weigh the needs of the community with the requests of individuals within the limitations of our budgets. In the face of those challenges, Central Saanich has great potential. And it has been an honor to get to work in our community. I've spent countless hours with many of you, and I can say with certainty that the love and respect that we share for this place gives us all reason to be optimistic. I've written about many of the positions that have been stated here tonight on my website. My colleagues have, have highlighted many of the issues that we have facing our community. But I look forward to your questions, and I raise my hands to you for taking the time out of your weekends to join us this evening to discuss our great community. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people and thanking them for hosting us tonight. I'm going to deliver my uh, introduction sitting down, but I wanted to stand up to also introduce myself to those standing at stage right. Uh, let you know I am not, in fact, a concrete pillar. <laughs> Thank you. So, getting down to it. I'm Liam Cooper, and I'm running for Central Sandwich Council, first because I live in this community, and therefore I am directly affected by the decisions of council. Second, I'm running because my partner Marnie and I are raising our sons, Toshi Keith, in Central Saanich. Therefore, we are invested in making sure that this community remains the kind of place that you might want to grow up in if you were a kid. Third, I feel inspired to run because at 30 years of age, I think that I can still represent the voice of a younger generation on council myself. And additionally, I'm running because I am confident that I can bring my uh, expertise and knowledge of the law in British Columbia to good use for this community. I understand from talking to my friends and neighbors, and also from my personal experience, that it has been a bitter and rancorous period in Central Sandwich over the last three years. I also understand that the decisions of council have generated some considerable controversy. With that in mind, my first priority at Councillor will be to hold the line on debt and taxes. Because this community cannot afford to further tax increases if we want to attract the kind of investment that we need in order to be able to preserve our special rural and agricultural character. If an elected councillor, I will prioritize rejuvenating Keating Crossroad, but also make sure that Brentwood and Sanishton are not left behind. I will also work to provide more leadership opportunities for the youth of Central Sandwich and to encourage a rejuvenation of the civic spirit in our community. I believe that we have a lot to offer to people of all ages and economic backgrounds, and that we should be proud of where we live. A final reason I am running is so that I can do what I can to restore a transparent and neighborly approach to local government. I still find it hard to understand why our current council would pass a motion that keeps those residents who aren't able to attend council meetings personally in the dark about the voting record of each councillor on major decisions. Those are my positions. Thank you again. Thanks for coming tonight, and please check Liam Cooper when it's time to vote. My congratulations, we are right on time. Um, we have 74 questions. Uh, looking at handwriting, 
Um, it seems to me that they've been um, handed in by somewhere around 60 people. Some people wrote several questions. And what I've done is, is um, most of them, uh, well, 40 out of the 74, are for, for all the candidates. And obviously, if I do that, we're going to be here for the rest of the, the year. So what I've done is um, put, uh, subsume the questions that are similar. And I'm going to start off with the ones to, um, some of the ones to all candidates, and then I'll go to individual candidates. The most commonly asked question um, was, would you support a motion to have councillors' votes made public? If not, why? And I'm going to start on the left and work this way this time. So, Mr. Cooper, you've already said it, but go ahead, briefly. Thank you. I would just like to reiterate that if elected councillor, I would vote, uh, introduce, second, uh, any motion to reintroduce recording of councillors' votes. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I have also taken a position and, and fully supportive of recording uh, the votes and uh, was quite troubled with the motion when it first came forward and, and uh, should be clear that uh, was not supportive of it and then continue to not be supportive of it. Uh, we should be recording the votes in the minutes. So thank you. Well, thank you. I did support the changes that came forward, though I, from what I've heard, I, I would probably support uh, uh, writing in the people who are opposed to vote, but the movers and seconds really is not that necessary because as an example, I'll suggest that when you're a committee chair, you're moving a motion uh, from your committee and it's seconded, even though you may not approve it. Uh, uh, so you're just moving as a process. So from my perspective, and some of the, uh, uh, Amina, I forget what her name is, one of the politicians, suggests that movers and seconds are not necessary, but certainly those who are opposed to a motion perhaps should be recorded. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, um, there is three of us on council who have requested that our negative votes be recorded. I think that it's something that should be done, and I will fully support um, bringing back uh, recording of votes. I also fully support recording of all votes. Uh, there's really no need for any of us to not know what our councillors are doing for us. I've heard long and clear um, from the citizens that they wish to know what's happening and they want an open and transparent municipal government. I too endorse the recording of votes and I've also uh, moved forward to find and put into the next budget the recording of uh, council and placing it on our website. Simple, quick, yes, of course. Thank you. I absolutely think it's necessary in a democratic society for us to be able to be aware of, of how our elected representatives vote. Um, I didn't support the change to the recording and uh, on, on issues where I've been feel, felt it really necessary to have my negative vote recorded, I have certainly asked for that to be recorded in the minutes. Um, and uh, I would like to see it just be, be par for the game that we uh, we record all the votes of council. Uh, I think it's also really important that we, we, we record who's in favor simply because uh, there's times when people are in conflict of interest and it may not immediately be apparent that they weren't part of that vote. So it needs to be clear. I don't think I have voted like this since I was five. So of course I'm gonna support the motion uh, as I age a little bit, the memory goes a little bit, so I appreciate actually a bit of a heads up of how I did vote. I can remember what I had for lunch today, so I'm all for it. It's crucial that the Council of Central Standards is effective in de delivering information to its fine citizens, so I'll support this 100%. The answer is yes, but I think we need to clarify that when there was a change in behavior in Council, that there was never a motion to stop recording for whatever reason no one can remember, uh, votes stopped being recorded six months before the last election. Well, the motion that was changed was to remove uh, movers and seconders, and in fact, I did do some research a few weeks ago and got to the bottom of an article by a parliamentarian by the name of Ellie Mina, who this council went and heard, and uh, he has a rather interesting article on why he suggests that movers and seconders need not be uh, included, but for simplification it could be there and some of the reasons have already been suggested. 
What we traditionally did in Central Saanich was to, re re was to uh, record the negative votes because it was assumed that whoever was at the table voted the positive, and there's a reason for that too, is because by law, when you uh, vote positive, if, if, as long as you don't stick your hand in the air during the call for the negative votes, you are presumed to have voted in, in favor of a motion. The other interesting thing is the bylaw has never changed, and so councillors have always been allowed to have their vote recorded in the negative over the last three to four years. That has not been removed from the bylaw. My view is that we should never have removed the movers and seconders, let alone the way we vote, whether it's positive or negative. The more information, the better for the people, the, the citizens of Central Sandwich. In addition, I think we need to have these meetings webcasted so that those people who can't attend the meeting can see them. Uh, th this day and age, we have uh, web cameras that cost $100. There's no reason why we can't webcast council meetings. Um, so my view is more transparency, more openness, so that you can make informed decisions. Thank you. sign their names to the motions they put forward and for which they have voted. There's nothing to hide if you're being honest and have no hidden agenda. All aspects of the vote, from the mover and seconder to how you voted, should be clearly identified, not only in the minutes, but at the time. Anybody who's been to our council meeting and has sat there trying to figure out who just voted for what, knows full well that the hiding of the vote is really easy at the moment. We need to know how people voted. That's how accountability happens in a democracy. I too believe in open and honest transparency in our government at every level. Uh, so I am in favor of recording of all votes. I'm not sure why um, in the past, it's been done away with. I'm sure it was not with any negative intentions to hide things. I, I do believe that. But I do believe that I stand behind what I vote for, and I have no problem anybody seeing what I have voted for. Well, you've heard it all. I mean, it's so silly not to record votes. Why wouldn't we just do it, right? Okay. I put it in writing, okay? I'm saying that we will record council uh, meetings, we will webcast them, and we will record votes. And I am willing to put it in writing. <laughs> the next question was asked um, by nine people in, in two different ways. Uh, several people asked it for all candidates, and several people asked it for one or two specific candidates. I'm going to make it for all candidates, and we'll start this time this way and go that. But I will be varying it for you folks in the middle future. And the question is, should candidates live in the municipality that will be affected by their decisions? And do you live in Central Saanich? And if not, where do you live? Yes, I live in Central, in Central Saanich, just up the road from here. And I will let you decide if it's your interest to have people who live here or not serving you on council because it's your decision. I know how I feel about it. I don't support people being on council who don't live here. Their decisions don't have any impact on themselves. Yes, I do live in Central Saanich, much to uh, some of the emails I've received saying that my mailing address is Victoria, BC. And what a shock that it was that some candidates were out campaigning that three people didn't live in Central Saanich. And lo and behold, I was one of them. I had no idea I didn't live in Central Saanich for the last 17 years. Um, I do believe you should live in Central Saanich. I think it's very important that you represent the taxpayers of the community that you live in. So, and yes, I do live here. Hi, I live in Central Saanich. I've lived here since 1970. I think it's really important that people live in the community that they're representing and helping make decisions for. I think it's absolutely vital. Thank you. 
Should candidates, uh, should candidates and or council members live in Central Saanich if they're representing us? Yes, absolutely they should. It's uh, incredible that they, that they may not, uh, that there are some that don't, uh, that uh, they can make decisions about making you pay taxes, but they won't be paying those same taxes. You could essentially run for councillor of Terrace or Prince Rupert and make decisions about their taxes and you wouldn't be paying those. Um, do I live in Central Saanich? Absolutely I do. I went to uh, the various schools here, and I hope to live in Central Saanich for a long time to come. Okay. I'll use this microphone. Uh, I always get caught off guard, this is a loud one. The, uh, yes, I, I certainly do live in Saanich, and I've lived here for uh, 20 years. Uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, clearly it's legal for people to, to live in other municipalities and run here. There's, no doubt about that, and, and there are several examples um, across the CRD where people don't, but generally speaking, it is of course most helpful if people do live here and have experience in the community. Yes, I do live in Central Saanich, and I, I agree with Ryan, I think the voters should decide, but I know I'm uncomfortable with someone imp imposing tax policies that they're not affected by, so, yeah. I also live here, I've been in Brentwood for 12 years now. For me, it's a tough one. I mean, I sit up here and I look at people around the table with me and I've got a great deal of respect for each of them because I know what piece I've put into just my little bit of this campaign and I know that each of them is doing just the same. And people ask me, well, why are you doing it? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna have a life if elected? And I say, no, but I, this is what I want. So I'm not gonna judge a person based on that. It, is it? What I would do, no, and that's why I'm not running in the city of Victoria. This is important to me to run here, but I'm not going to judge them. Uh, I would encourage you to get to know your, can your candidates, my fellow colleagues up here, and make a decision on your own. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, Alistair Bryce and I do live in Central Saanich uh, in the Mount Newton Valley. Um, I guess uh, uh, with respect to whether a uh, candidate should live in the municipality, uh, I was thinking this through and, and I was trying to think of an analogy and, and I guess the, the airplane analogy came to mind that if uh, you were sitting in an airplane at 30,000 feet and, and the pilot came over and said uh, new technology is allowing me to fly this airplane from the control tower, um, you might have a little bit of a concern about that. There's something about having people have a similar experience if the plane's not going to land well. So, but then I actually thought that actually that analogy can be taken a little bit further too because I have experience with the veterinary association that I'm a member of and, and, and actually we're required to have non-veterinarians as part of our um, association governing body. And I think there's actually a value sometimes in having a disinterested party as well. So maybe that air, air tower analogy can be extended to the point that actually we're pretty glad there is somebody in the air traffic control tower as well. And that maybe is part of the responsibility of being aware that there's a bigger community outside Central Science too. So if the voters see a value in having that person on council, well then that's democracy. Uh, yes, I live in Central Saanich on uh, Saninas Drive, actually, another fairly famous neighborhood in Central Saanich. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've, I've thought, I, I'll say, all I'll say about this is it's something I would um, consider when I'm voting myself. Uh, I've yet to make up my mind who I'll vote for, but there's a number of factors that I take into consideration, and, and that would be one of, one of many. Um, and I would say I, I can uh, entirely relate to Kathy's experience, having, uh, having lived on Rodolph for uh, much of my council experience, and uh, having to answer that question, what are you doing here in Victoria? It is a bit frustrating at times, <laughs> but I think uh, I'll pass it on. Thank you. I currently am living in Saanich, off Oldfield Road, where I started a Harvey farm this year. This year, I paid over $9,000 in property taxes in the District of Central Saanich. Um, I own the chocolate shop building and the house in behind it. I sold that this fall. Since then, we've moved and 
rebought a property in Central Saanich this fall, which are, as I stated, are currently renovating and plan to move into in the near future. Is it important? Provincial legislation says that anybody can run anywhere. What I do believe in is that the person should have a common knowledge of the area, know and be able to be a good counselor, listen to the people, make decisions for the people. It shouldn't be just based solely on whether they live here, but the type of person that's willing to help the community grow. So I'm one of those people that caused this question, I'm sure, but I have also bought a home this year, sold a home this year in Central Saanich, and plan to always be on the peninsula and always to be in Central Saanich. So thank you very much. Yep. Wayne Spencer, and yes, I live in Brentwood Bay here. Uh, it's somewhat important to me that uh, somebody making decisions uh, is going to be affected equally. Uh, there's a saying, uh, we don't all have to hurt the same, or we don't have to give the same, but we should all hurt the same. Uh, thank you. Well, this is a really, a really tough question, actually, uh, considering who is sitting beside me here. Um, I think, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think it's up to the community to decide who they want to vote for. If they feel that somebody brings the experience and knowledge uh, for that, uh, for a position on council that perhaps doesn't live in the community, then maybe we should be looking at that. Um, but I do feel it is important. And I must say, and I hate to say this, John, that counselors know the community and are easily accessible. That's very important to me. Well, thank you. I think this question was for me because obviously I don't live in the municipality. I moved out. I got remarried last ter last term, and uh, um, I am certainly proud. I'm glad I got married, actually. But in any event, <laughs> <laughs> in any event, I certainly moved up island and uh, my wife has to go north to Cooper Island to teach and I go south to the peninsula to work and I'm on the peninsula uh, six days a week and mostly seven because I'm down here with my granddaughter as well. So certainly from my perspective we certainly would love to move back but not certainly is not an option in the next two or three years until my wife retires. I guess uh, my only view would be that certainly it's up to you as uh, the, the citizens decide whether uh, you wish to have my experience on council and, and uh, as I'm aware of the issues I'm certainly in the community every day, every day and uh, so uh, no I understand the issue what it revolves in but certainly uh, I think uh, with my background and my integrity I think you've already seen how I've uh, been a member of council for six years so it's not as if I'm just a new person jumping in. Thank you. Um, yes, as I, uh, as I outlined in my uh, opening statement, I am here. I've been here for a very long time and we intend on uh, continuing to live here for uh, as long as we're here. Uh, I also think that, uh, as, as Councillor Mason said, that um, uh, it's important for people to be accessible. I know that uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, meeting and, and uh, connecting with people and I think that the accessibility is, is critical. Uh, but again, like some of the, the, my colleagues up here, I think that it is an important decision for you to make as to who you are going to elect to represent you. And if there are people uh, that can provide something, uh, that can provide something for your community, then that's a decision that you, that you have to make. It'll be a decision that I have to make as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. I do indeed live in the municipality in Sanish and myself, and I think that yes, even if there's not a legal requirement, there is an ethical obligation to live in the community that one would hope to serve as counselor. But uh, with that said, I don't want to get personal about this, and I, I won't speak about other candidates as individuals. I don't think that if a candidate lives outside of the municipality that that is in itself a reflection on their character. I do think though as residents that we're within our rights to consider whether some of the contentious decisions of the last three years would have been decided in exactly the same way if all the councillors involved had lived in the period continuously over that period. Thank you.
All right, it is now shortly past eight. Um, I propose to take, I think, make it a 10 minute break if people don't mind. And I have an apology to make to someone in the audience. I got a, an email from someone who apparently um, is allergic to cell phone uh, waves, radiation, whatever. And this person asked if I could uh, request people in the audience to put their cell phones in something called airplane mode. Being a Luddite, I don't know what airplane mode is, but I presume if you own a cell phone, you do. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, I'd be most appreciative. We'll see you back here in 10 minutes, and I mean exactly 10 minutes, and I'll give you a word a minute ahead of time. Thank you. Okay, folks. Um, This question has been asked by a number of people in, in different ways, so I'm going to sort of subsume it. Um, I'm going to do it in two ways. First of all, a, a question for all candidates. Do you feel it is acceptable to run a deficit budget to meet the needs of the community? And I'd like to also ask the incumbents what their position is about the debt that has been undertaken for the Savannah's pipeline, the tennis courts, and if the fire hall comes into existence, the fire hall. Right? So we'll start with the mayoral candidates and go this way, and then come back and go that way. So, Mr. Bryson. Sorry, Ian, can you just repeat the last part of the vote? For the, in for the incumbents. Um, the council has undertaken debt at the moment, this current council, and could you explain the rationale for that? Okay. Well, you know, this is a, a situation I'm, I'm going to have to break a little bit from my colleagues on, on council because uh, I, I brought a different philosophy to the council table regarding debt. and. Uh, um, I. I'm uncomfortable because council makes decisions and, and so I'm not second guessing council's decision here. I just want to be clear about how I voted and because that's what we're doing here is we're having a, an election of representatives. Um, first of all, the, the projects that are actually um, uh, intended to be debt financed at this point are the Mount Newton, St. Anna's water line. I actually had a conflict of interest on that project so I wasn't even part of that discussion about the project itself. Um, on East Saanich uh, Road Renewal, um, as has been pointed out earlier, uh, we've, we've actually borrowed 2.33 million and um, that was on about a $7 million project. So we were getting $2 for every dollar that the municipality put in. Um, however, that said, I have to be clear that I didn't support that debt because for years I've been asking us to actually replenish our reserves for us to save money as a municipality and be able to pay as you go. I'm a complete believer in the pay as you go philosophy. Nature, nature is a pay as you go system. There is no nut bank that the squirrel can go to and say, I didn't work hard enough this winter. Uh, if you could just carry me through I'll work harder next year, and my, my, my offspring will work harder. There is, there has to be a real-time system in terms of we're, we're responsible, I'm, oh gosh, in physics, the second law of thermodynamics, look it up. We, we have to be accountable. There is no uh, elasticity there in nature. So as part of the natural system, we have no choice but to be uh, Real time, there is no credit in nature. So I didn't support the debt on that because I've been asking for it, it, each budget so far. In fact, on the referendum questions last time in the election, there was a question about do, do we support municipal debt? And that question was because I asked for it to be on there. Um, and I, I, I mentioned several times that the community was clear that it didn't want us to go into debt financing. I, the Centennial Park Tennis Courts, again, I didn't support that debt. Um, I thought that we had actually uh, made a Cadillac project and I thought there were ways that we could have done it cheap, more cheaply. The one that I have supported is the new main fire hall because we're in a position that uh, 
we, we went through an alternative approval process. We also were in the position where we have to have this fireball for, for community safety. And unfortunately, we haven't saved for it, but we went through the alternative approval process and uh, it was shown that there, there, I guess because we didn't get the petition to uh, register enough votes in opposition, then that is a valid approval process. And had it not been approved on the pet petition, then we would have gone to referendum. I was satisfied that we had met the test on that particular one because we just have to build it and I regret that the community has not saved for it and I will be hoping to pay down that debt as quickly as possible and return to pay as you go philosophy. Thank you. I wish I could uh, say something here that would separate myself from my colleague, but um, I can't. Uh, what I can tell you, uh, because I was on council from 96 to 2008, um, with the council actually, uh, Councillor Thompson was on the 93 to 96 council, they saw a quarter of a million dollars of revenue cut out of their budget annually. Um, during my period on in office in the early or the late 90s to the early 2000s, we saw a million dollars worth of annual grant funding eliminated, which was a huge squeeze on the municipality. There were big debates around that council table. I st stood my ground and tried to convince council. I was one of out of one of several councillors who wanted to see these grant cuts passed straight through to the taxpayer so the taxpayer would know where that pain was coming from. But unfortunately, and this was under a, a Wayne Hunter administration, those grant cuts were phased in using the reserves as cushions. So we did lose a lot of our savings back then. Uh, traditionally, Central Sanch has been a pay-as-you-go municipality. I support that principle. As an economist, I understand that when you switch it from, from pay-as-you-go to borrowing, not only is it an indication that you're now living well, be, well uh, outside of your means, but it's an indication that you're doing a big intergenerational transfer that I don't think people really contemplate and may not be acceptable. So, to answer the question, I think as much as humanly possible, I would like to see us live within our means and stick to pay-as-you-go principles. I think a little bit, the way the question was worded, for me, it's been answered. Is it acceptable to run a deficit to meet the needs of the community? If it meets the needs of the community, then I believe it is. I look at something like the fire hall, and I don't see that as a nice to have. I spoke with the fire chief, and he told me about the estimated damage that could hit the fire hall should the massive earthquake that we're all expecting hit. I like the idea that if a disaster strikes, the fire department can help us. It's infrastructure like that that we can't just leave behind. I understand the pay-as-you-go philosophy, but we witnessed on the sitting on the Peninsula Rec Commission. Look what happened with the pool expansion. What was, was originally about a five or six million dollar project, when it was delayed, became an 11 or 12 million dollar project. For me, it's pretty obvious. If it meets the needs of the community, it's gonna work. I look at myself, I take it back to my own personal buying a house. Did I meet? live within my means? No. But has that been a better investment for me and my family in the long run? Yes, it has. It's very tempting to find fault within a group or a community. We need to be finding ways to meet the infrastructure needs of the future generation without burdening them with debt. I'm not here to say yes or no. That's not my job as a counselor. My job is to enact the will of the people of Central Spanish. Part of the challenge, I think, in terms of uh, the, the pay-as-you-go is that you still have, that you just pay up front. 
So in other words, the challenge we were looking at, that Chris alluded to for councils through Wayne Hunter and through Allison Hepkirk and into Jack Marr, is that you're looking potentially fighting for only a, only a, a four or five percent tax increase, and if you bring in the pay as you go to pay up front for a fire hall, then you're, t you're looking at at least a one-time jump, say, of 10 to 15 percent. The time to be talking about this, in a, in a sense, is at an election, where in fact one goes to the public and says, well, tell, tell you what, if you want to go pay as you go, we're going to have to have one hell of a big kick at your taxes now, and you're not going to get that service for another 10 years. So the other philosophy that I've heard in terms of borrowing, in terms of infrastructure upgrades, is that when you're in the community, you pay for it. If you move out, you're no longer paying for it. If you move in, you start to pay for it. But the challenge that one has to look at in terms of strictly pay as you go, which is very tough to do these days, as I'm sure some other people may say, is that you're still going to have to increase taxes significantly for that to happen. So pay as you go does not mean no tax increases. <coughs> Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I've heard a lot of people say that we uh, need a new fire hall. And I think the question, from my perspective, is not a matter of whether we need a new fire hall, it's whether we need a new Taj Mahal of fire halls. That question about how much we're spending for some of the infrastructure is key. How much can you afford? How much can Trudy, who lives on Meadowlark, with six kids, uh, two of whom are, uh, have some, uh, they're, well, they're mentally handicapped. She's struggling. Every extra cost that is put on her because of increased taxes impacts her family enormously. And so if we say yes to every project around the council table and we don't prioritize right, then it affects those people in their lives. So I think that it's important that we keep that in mind. The fact of the matter is we're already in debt now. So we've moved beyond the uh, pay-as-you-go model and we've taken debt. I'm saying that maybe we need to cool the engines of debt for a while and we need to focus on paying that down. disruption, there were lockouts, and so it was not possible for all of the ballots to get to the Municipal Hall. The Municipal Hall was asked to extend and said no, but the Provincial Government said yes and extended the HST referendum. So we need to look at these things a little more carefully. I don't believe that we should be running up the debt. I believe that councils for a long time into the future are going to be blamed for the debt that has been run up this time around. I firmly believe that we should be a pay-as-you-go municipality, we should be building our reserves, we should borrow only when absolutely necessary, and we should consult the public before we do that. I think that's vital. And as for the fire hall, there is a training center being built in North Saanich. There is an excellent training center at Royal Oak, if you ever go look behind the bus stops, you'll see the training center out back of the fire hall. We should be making arrangements to share those training centers so that we don't have to build a third one. I think they call that, well, that brings up the A word, but we won't go there. Um, I think that it is really important that we look for ways to retrench. We're going to have to do that now. We are not going to be able to build the fanciest version of a road, the fanciest version of a fire hall, and we never should have spent a dime on the tennis courts. They should have done what the people who built this building did. If you want to play tennis, you raise the money, you build the courts. That's what these people did who played tennis. like to say that deficits at times are inevitable. Nobody would like to see a deficit. 
uh, we no longer can be a pay-as-you-go community because if you want to be a pay-as-you-go community, you need to save as you go. So these councils that in the past that have professed that they're pay-as-you-go did not save as we went. Um, I, before me, have a five-year financial statements of from 2006 to 2010 of the annual surplus and deficit of this municipality. I'd just quickly like to share with you, 2006, the municipality was in a deficit of almost $300,000. 207, 1.5 million. The only year that they did not show a deficit was in 2008 when they had a surplus of half a million dollars. 2009, 1.9. So I have to say to you, although these past councillors profess to be pay as you go, um, the reality of that did not set in even when they were in council. Um, who owns their home here that does not have a mortgage on it? I think it's we would be negligent if we did not maintain or at one point had a mortgage on their home. Very few people can per purchase their homes outright, especially in this day and age. And I think we'd be negligent if we did not maintain our infrastructure and pay to maintain our municipality so that it's not crumbling beneath us. And as far as the fire hall goes, perhaps the costing is high. If I were elected, I would have to review the costing, but we cannot afford not to have a new fire hall because ours is not seismically safe. And, and Lord help any of us if we have that big earthquake and they can't un unbury themselves to come and help us. Thank you. Okay, not thanking aside, thank you, Alistair, thank you, Sue. Um, it's a question of uh, does a debt make sense? Is the project that is suggested that's going to incur the debt needed? Is it the right size and scale for the municipality? And is it serviceable? Do we have a plan for paying that debt? Do we know the interest rates? Do we know the term of that debt? And what happens is we go out and we make decisions and we're going to have to borrow money to pay for those decisions. Do we really have a clear plan about the term of the borrowing, the interest rates, what potential changes may occur in interest rates that could potentially impact us that we don't expect or we don't account for in our plan? If we don't do these things, what we have is debt that's endless. Deficits to just pile on and pile on and pile on and the taxpayer continues to have to service that debt as the taxes go up. So it doesn't matter about pay as you go, it doesn't matter about debt. It's about strategic planning. It comes down to, do we spend $9 million on a fire hall? Do we spend $4 million on a fire hall? Which one is serviceable? Which one serves the needs of the community? As Sue said, there are services that can certainly be shared. Could that reduce costs? Absolutely. Was that considered? Go and try and find that on the Central Spanish website or anywhere else. I can't find it. council who don't sit on the council or have never sat on the council um, analyzes the finances of this municipality. Council and staff takes the greatest care on every cent that's spent in this municipality. You cannot put a price on physical exercise, maintaining our infrastructure, parks. These are all things that make the community a whole. Everybody in this room is part of the community, yet each of us has different aspects and different priorities, but it's the community that's important. Our budgets, when we took over council, there's no money in the bank. Everybody preaches, or a lot of them preach the pay-as-you-go philosophy. Unfortunately, and this is where I agree with Olsa, is that there's no money being put aside. So if we're going to save for this, and, Count, and Thompson said the same thing, if we're saving, then let's start saving and a pay-as-you-go would work. If you don't save, it doesn't happen. This municipality has an infrastructure that's aging and needs work and needs it now. You don't get the option of doing it later. The costs for doing construction have never been lower in the last eight years. 
There's a recession happening out there. There are contractors that are hungry to do this. We have provincial and federal governments at a time when we were considering this that were willing to give us $2 and the dollar that we invest. It's crazy not to take advantage of something like that. If we don't do it now, it's going to be double in 10 years. Pay as you go will never catch up. Because the pay as you go philosophy of the past, nobody was saving, we are now in a position where we have to jump ahead. We can't raise taxes. We raise taxes at 15 or 20% to support a pay as you go. That's ridiculous. We borrow our money through a provincial body that gives us the lowest interest rate in the entire province. We're not running out there and getting 8% loans. Our staff spends hours and hours and hours analyzing every cent spent, analyzing the projects, and making sure that you get the best bang for your dollar. You can't put a price on physical exercise. You can't put a price on repairing our roads, building a fire hall. Life safety is the most important thing in our community. It has to be a priority. We've been told for years, well before this council, that we needed a fire hall. There was no money set aside for that fire hall. This council reacted and did the things that were positively needed for this community to make sure that we looked after all of the citizens. Thank you very much. Yes, I think that you have to look at uh, debt in, in two different ways. Uh, if you relate it to your personal finances, there's credit card debt, which is bad, and house debt, uh, which is good. And I think that uh, debt for needs and, and capital out outages, uh, like preparing, or preparing for the future uh, and taking care of the infrastructure, which we all use, is something that uh, debt is sometimes necessary, especially in the past, they haven't saved for it. So uh, if you start saving now, by the time our grandkids are uh, avail uh, our age, we might be able to afford a new fire hall. I think that uh, you know it may not be right right now, but unfortunately, uh, when we do need something, if you don't have the money, then you have to uh, take up debt. Thank you. I think uh, Councillor Stiglinka brought up some really good points on, um, and I and I won't uh, belabor them. Um, I'd like to say that you ask us to maintain our municipality. You ask us to maintain the levels of service. In order to do that, we need to spend money. Our costs are going up constantly. As you know, we have gas prices going up. We have transportation costs. Lots of things are going up all the time. And as has been said before, we will not catch up and be as a pay-as-you-go municipality again. It's like paying cash for a house. Nobody does that. You wouldn't let your roof leak. You would go out and borrow the money if you didn't have it. Because if your roof is leaking, it's going to get bigger and it's going to get more damage to it, such as East Sandwich Road. Mind you, I, I do have to say on the tennis courts, I did not agree with them. I don't believe that most of us would go out and borrow for a swimming pool. So that's where I sit. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think the, uh, you, must, you must realize legislatively we don't run a deficit. We can have debt, but we cannot run a deficit. So municipalities do not have deficits every year. They, have, they may have debt. And with respect to uh, pay-as-you-go, I think there is an infrastructure deficit within this municipality that we have to address. The fire hall is not a Taj Mahal. It was, it's a, it's a knockoff from other, uh, other fire halls within the municipal, other, um, within BCs, uh, sort of a standard with uh, minimal changes. So I think from that perspective. But from my, I think really we have to look at, uh, philosophically, uh, if I, if I'm living here for the next 20 years and I'm helping to pay for that fire hall for the next 20 years. Uh, and if I move away, I'm not paying for it. Do I want, do I want to live here? Do you want the people that live here just for four or five years have a 20 or 25% tax increase to pay for it for that, for those, for the first five years? I think you've got to realize, to some extent, you've had a free ride because of municipal halls being paid for, for 
about the last 35 years. So we've had a real uh, sort of a free ride to some extent, I would suggest, because of the, uh, the fact that we have not done infrastructure for about 20 years. And, and this council is catching up. And if you can get $0.30 cent dollars to do it, I think that is a good deal if we can get the sh federal sharing. East Sandwich Road was on the books for over 25 years, and we finally got it done. And we certainly wouldn't have done it ourselves for the, the price for sure. So I think there is, we have to sort of balance it. It still has to be fiscally prudent, but uh, I think to pay as you go, you can't afford uh, 15 to 20 cent percent tax increases for the next three or four or five years. I, I don't, I think you'd be, you'd have us hanging an effigy outside. Thank you. <laughs> Well, 13 candidates certainly uh, burns through a lot of the information here. I, I, I do just want to say that, that we have, as a council, borrowed $2.33 million for East Sandwich Road. We've provided the authorization for staff uh, if they need it. Uh, after applying for all of the grants, Brownfield grants, infrastructure grants from the federal and provincial governments, to, to borrow the remainder of those projects after, of course, we we go out to tender and get the, the con, uh, construction contracts back. So these are, um, for, for many of these projects, at least three of these projects, we're talking about a bit of a moving target. I also have to say that we've inherited these discussions. These discussions have been going on in Central Saanich about a fire hall, about East Saanich Road, as uh, Councillor Garrison pointed out. Uh, the discussion about the tennis courts was, uh, was an ongoing, nearly decade-long discussion. It was on the books. And these were, these were projects that our council, when we got elected, inherited that discussion. A lot of the discussion about the, ten, about the uh, fire hall um, had, been, had been going on um, when I was attending council, watching it with an interest to run for my first term. Many of those discussions uh, continued into our council and we were asked to make some very difficult decisions. I think when, when you talk to our fire department and you, let the, and, and, and you understand that uh, that these are young men and women who are running into a burning building when most people are running out. We need to provide them the infrastructure to ensure that they can return home to their families safely. I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's also important to point out that we're not just building one single fire hall. We're building an entire fire infrastructure for those young men and women. We're building a fire hall, for a training facility, so that they can do their jobs better. And we're also building a satellite fire hall for them in Saniston. So these are actually two facilities, not just a single Taj Mahal uh, Cadillac version of a fire hall. We're actually having to build infrastructure because we have not done it for decades. And so I think that it's very important that we are very clear on what it is that we're doing. Thank you. difficult question and I really appreciate whoever asked it. Um, I think I agree with some of the current councillors who have spoken uh, to the effect that we cannot simply defer infrastructure investments on to future generations and I don't think it's a good practice to tie the hands of elected officials um, and we have to trust our councillors to make decisions in the best interest of the community. That said, if we look at the large picture, I don't know about you but I'm very concerned with how in North America we have raised our uh, senior city increase in government and personal debt over the last 50 years to the point where we are almost in a, a debt crisis as a, as a country and as a people. And I think on a local level, um, the relative position of Central Saanich as a uh, local government has not improved over uh, the last three years. We, our debt ceiling has rapidly increased. And in terms of the question of where do we go from here, uh, some of the other candidates have uh, made an analogy between household expenditures and uh, local government expenditures, and I, I think I would continue that analogy uh, for my answer. Um, if you were going to get a mortgage, you would want to make sure that you had a job first. I mean, it, it's, it's true that you, nobody pays cash for a house, but you want to make sure that you know where your money's coming from. And in an analogy to local government, I would want to make sure that I know where the new revenues were going to come from before we allowed any more uh, major capital investments. And I would want to make sure that those, and that those revenues weren't just going to come from increased property taxes. To me, it comes back to the question of where are we going to get 
uh, more commercial and business development in a way that conforms to our official community plan and provides jobs and uh, broadens the tax base for our residents. Uh, similarly, if you were going to buy a car, you would want to make sure that you would save money for the down payment, but also that you knew that you could afford ongoing maintenance and gas for that car. So to me, that speaks to the importance of making sure that we uh, have a plan and uh, it's a plan that makes sense and the numbers add up to replenish our, our capital funds um, and our, our ability to uh, increase our savings before we make any further spending commitments as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, I'm going to ask some questions of individual candidates, um, and then we'll get back to the ones for everyone. This one's for Kathy Onstead. Uh, you state that you will show respect for all citizens, but as a co-op candidate, you were very harsh to your co-candidates. How do you reconcile this with your respect for all citizens platform? Well, that didn't take long, did it now? I was waiting for this one. Um, I have to say, um, it was important to me at that particular AGM that that question is referring to. There had been a lot of negative campaigning and underhanded campaigning going on with regards to the co-op AGM. And it was very important to me that that room of individuals that were there to vote actually knew the enormity of what had transpired and that it was out in the open. And it was just very important that I was just open and honest about the struggles that the co-op had endured during that election campaign with a lot of negative campaigning behind the scenes to undermine anything that we were trying to do in a positive light. Um, so that hence, I do respect all individuals and um, at the same time, if I, I hope never to attack anyone, but at the same time, I don't choose to be a, have attacks put onto myself and, and my individual board members that I sit on that board with. And this one is for Adam Olson. Uh, Mr. Olson, do you pay taxes in Central Saanich? Um, I, I pay every cent of tax that I'm entitled to pay. Uh, I live on Sartlet First Nation, and uh, yes, there is a, a chief in council in Sartlet that makes decisions uh, for the land that I live on. So technically, I do not pay property taxes to Central Saanich. We do pay, uh, through Sartlet First Nation, we do pay servicing. Um, so, I, so we are rate payers to the district. We uh, pay for servicing for sewer and water and fire. And in fact, uh, both the, the local First Nations and, and Central Saanich and part of uh, the interest that I have going forward as a councillor is that we are going into a new generation of servicing contracts with the First Nations and, uh, and th they will change significantly. And I think that this is an incredibly important discussion for our community to be engaged in. As we, uh, as we determine how those rates will be paid and, uh, and, and work in a partnership with the two First Nations. Thank you. Right. The next one is, is going to be a little bit complicated for Mr. Garrison because he's going to be asked two different questions. The first one is for um, Mr. Sinclenka and the Garrison. And it goes, you voted in favor of deleting the section of the OCP that prohibits big box stores of over 50, 54,000 square feet in Central Saanich. Although well, the intent of this motion was for the Keating area, Pope Burns says there are no parcels of land in the Keating area that could accommodate such a large store and provide parking. So where exactly would a store that large go in Central Saanich, and why did you vote for it? Thank you. Enhancing Keating, it's a difficult and strange word. What we have to do is government has to move away and stop putting barriers in front of business. Let business operate business. We need to make sure that we create an environment that allows business to succeed and flourish in our community. Two of the parcels of property that will be coming up potentially in the future are the gravel pit and, uh, and uh, another piece of property there. Those would potentially be open to business. We do not want to put any roadblocks to anybody considering to move to Keating. They still have to go through the process, come before a council, go through staff, go out to public hearing. 
So it's not like we have input. So why would we potentially put roadblocks? The other point on that is that we were looking, both First Nations have large developments coming with commercial properties, building malls and everything on their properties. We have to make sure that we have every opportunity to invite business to come to Keating. So if that re involves removing one barrier so that somebody might look at that area before they move on to another piece of property somewhere else where we get no benefit in the community and no taxes, then I'd rather them come before us and present their opportunity so we as a community can make that decision whether we would like them there or not, but not to block them before they even get a chance to come to us. Thank you. Mr. Garrison, before you, you start answering, here's the second part of your question. Um, earlier this year, uh, Alistair Bryson proposed that Council eliminate the provision in uh, the secondary suite bylaw that requires the owner to live on the property. Uh, you did not vote for it since you said it was a council-based initiative without any application. Recently, you voted to allow big box stores in Central Saanich, which was also a council-based initiative with no application, and you supported it. So why the difference in those two issues? Basically, with respect to the, uh, the big box issue, I think it's just uh, to make it uh, at least someone come, as Councillor Solanka said, to come forward. Because have you heard what's, uh, all the rumors are out there, what's going on in the Sawak lands or whatever. There, uh, there's all sorts of rumors of uh, uh, some major developments going over there. And I think if we want to revitalize Keating, we want to make sure that at least uh, there's an opportunity for someone to come forward to at least uh, come to Council. And I think if you, uh, I'm surprised, uh, talking to Hope Burns, I, she mentioned there may be only a couple of sites on Keene that may or may not support that type of uh, development, and there may or may not, they may not fit. But uh, from my perspective, it was just a matter of strategically um, giving an opportunity for applicants to come forward and uh, to hopefully uh, counteract some major developments that may occur uh, on non-tax-based land in the municipality. And with respect to the... Uh, uh, with respect, what was it, the sweet bylaw? Yeah, with respect to the sweet bylaw, uh, cer I certainly felt that, uh, from just from my personal perspective, it was one of those initiatives uh, that was brought forward that I didn't feel that uh, we really had had enough public input on it to really make a decision in the sense of uh, there didn't seem to be a, a push from, uh, uh, I guess, from the public to change it, and, uh, and I didn't see it at that time uh, to the change really was necessary. And the next one is for Bob Thompson. In 1996, you quit council partway through your term. Why would we trust that you won't get angry and quit again? <laughs> well, you know, I, I've heard this now for uh, 15 years. Someone has to bring it up every time. I would point out that um, I work very, for people that know me and the projects I do in this committee, in this community know the extreme diligence I put into it. From 2002 to 2008, I, I uh, was chairman of the Planning and Development Commission uh, Committee, which is the uh, most intense committee, so to me it's, uh, it's simply a non-issue. Okay. Um, we will now move back to questions for all the candidates. And those of you who didn't get specific questions, maybe you won't feel too badly about it given the questions that were asked. <laughs> um, we had several people um, ask this and in various ways, but I'm going to take this one. Um, other communities support their seniors associations by providing an operational grant. When you provide the seniors with an operational grant, uh, one at least equal to the grant given the Boys and Girls Club of some $20,000. And the person says you are um, requested to answer only yes or no, but I presume if you want to expand a bit, you may. So let's start this time um, with Mr. Jensen and work this way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> 
we're talking about budgets and money and deficits, etc. So how do you answer this question when you haven't looked at the budget? I'd like to say yes. I'd also like to say yes, but I would also, it's only responsible to look at the budget. If there's a way to do it, I would say yes. I would say yes, if financially possible, but it's, a, it's very difficult for me to give a straight yes on this without having more information. Nature willing, we're all going to get up to uh, uh, our golden years, so I would say yes. Um, obviously, budgeting is a concern. We've had more grants and aids come forward this year uh, than in pre previous years. Uh, they've been deferred till after council. I believe the number was $230,000 up from about 96. That's well beyond the 1% uh, of the budget that would normally be used. Yeah, obviously we'd all like to say yes, and I'm hearing members of council um, hedging on this, and, and I, I have to hedge too, because when you sit at the table, you actually have to weigh up all the priorities of the community, and quite simply, it, it's a ridiculous question to ask uh, the candidates at this point, simply because we don't even know what the $20,000 $20, or whatever is for. So the first question you would ask is, what do you need it for? And you would decide if that was a priority for the community. I'm going to say maybe, <laughs> but I think we have to ask a more fundamental question with the grants and aid process. I give personally to charities. I know many of you in the audience do too. Um, you have to ask yourself, is this something you want your local government doing? Um, sorry to be a cheapskate, but currently we have it as a 1% of budget goes to uh, grant and aids, so that's an escalator. So in other words, when we have budget, as our budget gets bigger, some would say that's not good management on our end, and we also give out more grants and aid, which bumps it up even more. I realize that the money that we give out to these charities is uh, very appreciated by them and helps them a lot. I just don't know if property tax is the appropriate use for that kind of money. Um, it's one I've always wrestled with. But it's, as far as this particular question, I would uh, balance it within that framework, uh, unless council has determined to change that policy in the future. I'm also a maybe. I'm getting closer to senior year, so it's, but uh, nonetheless, um, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous question to ask. Until you sit there, until you see the budget, the revenue, and hear all of the different cases and what they're going to use the money for and determine who gets what and how to divvy it up evenly or who doesn't get something or who gets what they ask for, um, you can't answer that question now in any honesty. Um, council is always, and this council and the council of the past, I'm sure have always taken each of these very seriously, but once again, the pot's only so big, and as you can see, it's doubled up this year. The requests get bigger and bigger as the recession gets tighter, and everybody starts looking for money at all avenues. We can't keep increasing these grants. We're at 1%, and I believe that we have to hold true to that line and be able to work with as best we can those dollars to the community. Thank you. I would like to say yes, but uh, unfortunately I think that uh, the kids are a little bit more vulnerable than seniors. Seniors have worked and have income still, and the children unfortunately do not have any income. Well, I think I'm going to get really specific here. Our uh, seniors need a new roof on their building. And, uh, and um, the, the rest of the roof was replaced on the cultural center. 
And I think that uh, we have a group of seniors here who have worked very hard over the years. They have maintained the center, they have improved the center, they give a place for our, our seniors to go, to meet each other, and um, we, give, we give nothing to our seniors. So I really believe that if they need a new roof, we should give them a new roof. And it should come in as a supplemental item, not as a grant and aid. Well, I just on as the most senior guy here. I, uh, <laughs> actually, I guess I am. Uh, and also the chair of the finance of men, uh, the grants, whatever, it, and the budget process. It's a painful process, and I think all council members recognize that it's, it's hard work, and you have to go through a lot of, uh, I guess, give and take. So I, I'm not going to say yes or no. Obviously not. It's coming. It's on the grant schedule. I think right now. So. Uh, the new council will have to deal with that, and as mentioned, the grants are at least a double, or all double, and there may be other avenues to look at it, but it's all your money we're spending. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the question, and uh, I think, um, I think that's it. Some of the difficulty with this question lies in the fact that there is a request that's on the table and there's about 25 other requests from a number of other organizations on the table as well. So I think that it is very difficult for us, especially those that are at the table, but then as well I think that the candidates that are not at the table understand the sensitivity in this and making this commitment tonight to you. That's why you're getting a lot of maybes and I would like to. I think it's important to point out that the Boys and Girls Club does come forward every year with a grant made for, uh, request for $20,000 and Council makes a decision about that in, in light of all of the other requests that are made. One thing I would like to say about the grant and aid money that, that does get distributed to local community groups, they often leverage that money and they, and they actually make that money turn into, they, they use it in other grant uh, applications that they make and they can actually make that money work for them, in, in, uh, it becomes a very efficient way for them to then go and, and get other money from other granting uh, agencies. So I just say that I think part of the difficulty here is that there is many, many other very good community groups that also have this request. So it's put us in a very difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sound like a bit of a broken record in saying first that I would, I would like to say yes, depending on the ability of council to pay. But I do, I really want to make the point that as counselor, I would not be willing to take an approach that would pit one group of our community against another, or to see a gain in support, including funding support, to one group as a loss to the other. So in answer to the question, I would have to say that I, I can't give you an answer without, uh, that, that doesn't have all the information in front of me that would include not only our budget, but I would want to hear from both groups, and I would actively solicit the input of both of those groups in the hope that, as counselor, I could make sure that both the Boys and Girls Club and the seniors of this community receive support from us commensurate to their needs and our ability to pay. Thank you. Great. It is now 9 o'clock, shortly thereafter. Um, let's take another 10 minute break, you guys, ladies. And let me offer a plea. Uh, we've got to pay for this hall if you'd like to drop a loony or a toonie in the box in the back that says rocks. We'd sure appreciate it, because otherwise it comes out of our pockets, and there aren't many of us. Thank you.